Welcome to the February 8, 2016 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we have the roll call, please? Council Chair McCausland? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. And Councilor Sullivan? Here. Wonderful. Thank you. Would you all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first order of business tonight is the presentation of the Ralph Gould Award, and I'm happy to have Councillor Jessica Sullivan give the presentation to this year's recipient. Thank you, um, Chairman McCausland. Before proceeding with the presentation of the Ralph Gould Award to Norman Jordan, I'd like to recognize Norm's family and friends who are here tonight. His son Greg is here, if you'd please stand for everyone. And there are friends, there are members of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society here. Would you please stand so the council can recognize you? And any other friends that are here that I'm, for the senior citizens perhaps, advisory commission? Okay. All right, thank you. The Ralph Gould Award was established in 1986 and was named for the late Ralph Gould to recognize his community service and subsequently to recognize those who provide community service in the same spirit as Ralph Gould. Norman is the 27th Cape Elizabeth citizen to receive this award since its inception, and he joins a distinguished and diverse group. Norman is a lifelong resident of Cape Elizabeth. He graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School in 1953 and served in the United States Army in the later 1950s before returning home to Cape Elizabeth. When his father died in 1985, Norman moved from Shore Road back to the farm where he grew up at the corner of Ocean House and Fowler Road. Norm has been an active volunteer citizen. He served on the first library planning committee from 2006 to 2008. He campaigned to keep Fort Williams free when the town was considering uh, parking fees. And he served most recently on the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission and on Cape Elizabeth's 250th anniversary committee. Norm is a descendant of Cape Elizabeth's original settler, the Reverend Robert Jordan, and he has been heavily involved with the Jordan family's national organization and has been their contact in Cape Elizabeth. Norman has been a member of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society for many years, and he is a past president. He's been managing the sizable Jordan collection for almost 10 years. He is well known for generously availing himself to many people wanting to learn more about the history of Cape Elizabeth or, for example, the history of the old farmhouse they just bought. Norm's farm is a long-standing agriculture business and still operates in the manner of the best of Cape Elizabeth's old-time traditions. His farm stand sells flowers and raspberries by the honor system. He's recently added Christmas trees and sold some this year also by the honor system. He told me that a gentleman came by in a rush right before Christmas to buy a tree but had forgotten his wallet. Norm told him to drop off the payment when he could. No payment came, and Norman thought, oh well, I guess that's that. However, a check did arrive in the mail from out of state on January 26. <laughs> His farm is locally famous for flowers and has been for several generations. It's not uncommon for someone now living away to stop by and tell Norman that they used to pick flowers at his farm when they were growing up. Norman's flower gardens have touched people's lives in ways that most of us are unaware of. Last summer, a rather poignant event occurred relating to Norman's flower gardens. A gentleman in his 60s stopped by to select two large bouquets of flowers. <clears throat> Norman later found out that the man's mother had recently died. 
and she herself had picked flowers on Norm's farm for many years. When she could no longer drive, her family would bring her to Norm's and help her pick flowers. The family burned the two bouquets of flowers, mixed those ashes along with their mother's ashes, and scattered them all together. Norman, ever the historian, is a well-traveled farmer and has been to many faraway places such as Morocco, which he told me when I was chatting with him was the first country in the world to recognize the United States as an independent nation and that we establish our first foreign embassy there. Norman's love and knowledge of Cape Elizabeth's history are legendary. He has been a valuable resource to many Cape citizens, those of us who have lived here for years and those who have just arrived. Members of both the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society and the 250th Anniversary Committee and the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission have shared that Norm's stories of Cape's history always bring tremendous perspective and fun to the business at hand. Over the years, Norm has served Cape Elizabeth citizens in many ways, such as local farmer, historian, activist, and archivist, and always with a touch of humor and warmth. On behalf of the town of, excuse me, on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, I'm delighted to present the 2016 Ralph Gould Award to a beloved local legend, Norman Jordan. Please join us in congratulations. Norm, excuse me, I've asked Norman if he would say a few words. There you go. I, I don't usually say a few words. I usually <laughs> drag it out for half an hour or so. Um, and I've got two cousins on the council there, and I think if I did a little digging, I could find a third. Um, <laughs> yes, this family thing is a addiction. <laughs> Lots of times I'll be, had something I should be doing, but I was on the computer looking for somebody that got married in Nebraska, 1822 or something. Um, yeah, that story about the, the um, ashes, um, she asked, that day my ex-wife was there uh, and uh, my youngest grandchild, my little girl, so she was probably eight at the time, um, they took her down to the Kettle Cove. And Althea came back and told me about it, that she said uh, there were a group of people there obviously splitting ashes. And one of the men said, oh, she got in my eyes. <laughs> and then a week later, two weeks later, I went out there one day, there was a man out there just kind of walking around, maybe picking some flowers. And he said, my mother used to come here all the time, and we picked in the same story. It was the same people that my ex-wife saw for the ashes. I thought it was nice. Yes. Um, a lot about Cape Elizabeth. When I was in school, that was a stage. A pretty good stage, too. It had uh, the curtains and the drop curtains and everything. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember the name of the play. I can't think, but I meant to look that up. In the senior high school, I was a senior in high school. We were senior class. I always put a play on here. Uh, I was stage manager. <laughs> I don't know how much well I did. Uh, my flower garden is, you know, several of you ladies and men even uh, picked flowers there. Um, I just sent in the orders for seeds a couple of days ago. Um, and I get a lot of people talk, uh, tell things. And one lady, obviously Spanish, 
Uh, the lady said she's picking flowers. She's the first time she's ever picked. So I went out and talked to her. And I said, first time you ever picked flowers? She said, yes. I said, well, that's, you know, that's nice. You have a good, she said, I'm enjoying it very much. And very nice here, perfect English. She must be an English teacher someplace. Um, and I said, well, she said that first time you ever picked. Yes, yes. And I said, well, where, where are you from? And she said, Bolivia. And I said, well, they raise a lot of flowers in South America. And uh, she said, not where I live, uh, nothing but rocks and ice. It was up in the high Andes. Um, another lady once kind of grinned at me and said, you're doing this all wrong. And I said, uh, yeah? She says, well, yes, you should be giving us these flowers free. Judge. He says, and charge us $50 an hour for the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then the one more um, lady this summer told me, she said, well, we, my husband got transferred here to Southern Maine last year, and we came and rented a house because uh, we wanted to be sure we, what we bought was what we wanted. And we made a pact, and he looked for houses, and I looked for houses that we knew both would like. And, you know, two or three, three or four weeks or sometime. But she said, I had the last choice. Uh, it was up to me which one we did, no matter what. So she said, we, we went and looked at these two, two places, one in the Cape and one in Falmouth. And um, she came back to her husband and she says, no, go take the one in Cape Elizabeth because that's where the flower garden is. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. Yeah, my family, I never... I was in the fourth grade, which was right corner window right over there, and the, the, the bank in the right there, but there was nothing but gra bank of gravel. There was no sidewalk, no steps, no nothing. Um, and we were out there playing mobs. It was just, it was evidently not too, I don't know what the date would have been. We'd find out. A, <laughs> somebody opened the window, leaned out, and said, Germany surrendered. Um, I don't know what the wind did, Jimmy. What, it must have been warm enough so we were playing marbles. A um, few other, Miss Story at the upstairs windows, up, upstairs, the big room. Uh, she couldn't have weighed 98 pounds, ringing wet. And I'll tell you, some of these guys were scared to death of her. Because um, she would, you know, this was 1946, 45, 47, 48. She would, I see. <laughs> I saw the stone wall cell down here where the men's room, boys' room was. She had this kid and she grabbed him by the scalp of the neck and banged him up against that wall hard enough so he fell on the ground when he, she let go of him. Um, and you didn't go home and tell your father or your parents that she hit you because he'd had it 25 years before. <laughs> and, he, and she taught another 25 years after, I think after I went through with her. Um, when the Yoki Alexander came ashore, went to school, it was, pretty, it was, it was all right then, nice, nine o'clock, but the wind was still blowing hard. Um, she thought we ought to see that. And she got the bus driver and loaded us in the bus and took us down there. No, no, no uh, authority, just her doings, the bus driver. And we saw him. Um, I remember years later, late enough, so I was working at Jonesy's, I saw, and of course in those days there wasn't much between the high school, the old 1930 building in here. Um, I saw several people, uh, young people, um, graduates, come up through there. I knew some of them, they'd come up through there. They were coming here to uh, say goodbye to Miss Story, because she taught him something. She had a sister that taught in Scarborough, and they traveled every summer. One man said, he said, my wife and I were sitting in a restaurant in Italy someplace, and we looked over there and Miss Story and her sister sitting at the next table to us. Yeah. And yeah, the Jordan family was very deep. 
we have uh, probably rolling up in the gut, and Lewiston probably has got uh, 40, 40, 40 odd thousand descendants from that one couple who got married on Richmond Island in 1643. Um, not all of John name, of course, but we changed them. And they traveled all over the world. Those little tiny ships, some of them. I had one, and women were, the sails didn't like females aboard ships, but the captain's wife could go. And if the captain's wife had children, the first mate's wife could go to help take care of the children. Somebody said, well, maybe she was a school teacher. And one, one of distant cousins had three children. One bought Dockside, Calcutta, India. Another bought South Pacific, at sea, South Pacific. The third bought Dockside, London, England. They were like really got around. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell the story, but 1860, a family chartered a clipper ship out of New York to go to Hong Kong. And I thought that the captain was married to a Jordan girl. Uh, turned out to be wrong. Unusual name, too. They had a, a big birthday celebration in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So the girls, one of the girls was 12, about 20 something people in the family was aboard the ship. Um, the little girl was 12. And the cap sea captain's birthday was the same day. The man, he owned the boat and the captain. Uh, he was, she was 12 and he was uh, maybe 32. And I knew immediately my, my man would have been in the 60s. And that girl um, had a birthday in the middle of the Indian Ocean in um, 1860. was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mother. Wow. <laughs> that's why there's so much about it on the internet. I think probably that's a uh, hello. <clears throat> I could go for a long time. Thank you. Uh, when, they, when they came over to see me, she came over to see me. I did. And I, she, she told me that I said, what? Who? Me? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Before you leave, can we get a picture for just a minute? Sure. Sure. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure. Let me keep my hands. No. Yeah. I didn't make a face. I didn't. <laughs> want to do one without the glasses? I'll check it. Want, want to do one without the glasses? You can do one. I was. Some, some of us. Some of us had out through the kitchen. Fuck. And the children who were in the 40s and 30s. We're in the living room watching old slides, and somebody says, ah, look at this one. I knew who they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations from all of us. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to town council reports and correspondence. I have a couple of quick items tonight. Um, just in case there is anyone who doesn't already know this, we had a ribbon cutting this morning at the library. Went very well. That building looks fabulous. It is open for business. If you haven't been in, I hope you'll stop by. I think it's a tremendous addition to the town center and really a wonderful resource for our community. And thanks to all the folks who've been involved in that process. All right, I'll clap too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, also, I wanted to mention that um, for those of you who hadn't heard this already, I'm sure it's not news for most people in the community, I'm sorry to say that our school superintendent Meredith Netto has announced that she'll be leaving us this summer. We wish her well in her new position in New Hampshire. 
In the meantime, I know the um, folks on the school board are working on, uh, I think they've hired a consultant to help them work on the process for finding her replacement. And last but not least, I also wanted to mention that we had on the council, we had an email today from the chair of the school department uh, letting us know that the proposed schedule of the process for the adoption of the FY 2017 budget, that document is now available online if you look on the school department website. It'll give you an idea of what the process is over the next couple of months as they're working through their budget procedures. That's it from my end. I suspect there are a couple of council members who have something they'd like to report on tonight. Yes, Patty. Um, yes, I do. I um, just wanted to add my accolades to uh, all those that were involved in the opening of the library. If you haven't been, it's absolutely spectacular. Um, I would encourage everybody to go. And I, as the liaison to um, the library trustees, I just wanted to um, let the community know that there is um, the staff and um, all the trustees worked really, really hard putting together an opening month of events. We have 28 days um, of events in 20, excuse me, 20 events in 28 days. And things like robotics demonstration, there's gonna be a jazz concert, a piano concert, a winter fest and more. So I would encourage you just to quickly, um, there's some flyers about town, but also you can go on to the Thomas Memorial Library uh, .org website and there is a listing of events there. So please come, enjoy. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Just that the Ordinance Committee will have a meeting at 1.30 on February 23rd. We'll be continuing our discussion of the Boards and Commission's Ordinance. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the Finance Committee report. I will defer to Michael. Hmm? I'll defer to you since I didn't oh, okay. put, put yeah, the they, together. The municipal finances thus far are, are working out uh, pretty much according to plan. There's, there's a few issues with maintenance of equipment that's a little bit over budget, but obviously with the lighter winter uh, thus far, uh, although that seems to be changing, uh, you know, those, we seem to be having some savings in, in those areas. But overall, things are in pretty good shape. Uh, people are still, buying, still continuing to buy new cars, and uh, things are in good shape. Great. Thank you. Anyone have any questions on that? Comments? No? All right. We'll move on to citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda tonight. Do we have any citizens who wanted to speak? I'll remind you, please step up to the microphone, give us your name and address, and please be respectful of our approximately three-minute time limit. Thank you. Okay. My name is Rich Moran, 62 Cross Hill Road. Just yesterday, I became aware of an article in the Century regarding the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Among other issues was mention of the club plans to come before the council and seek to have Sarah Lennon recused from all discussions regarding the gun club. Specifically, club officers also will ask during their next appearance before city councilors that it recuse Lennon from further participation in deliberations regarding to the club. I strongly object to such an action. Having opinions about an issue does not constitute a conflict of interest. Before I proceed, I should note that I do not know Ms. Lennon or her opinions. I've seen her in a couple of meetings, but I've never spoken to her. Precedent was cited in the case of Jamie Wagner, who was recused for the same reason. I observed that action when it was taken. I feel it was wrong then and still is. Actually, in order to be fair, later uh, Jamie sided with the gun club on most issues that came to the FRC. So further, if we're going to consider recusal for opinions, then I think that should apply also to Caitlin Jordan, who demonstrated her support for the gun club in newspaper articles on the FRC and in council meetings. In conclusion on that first issue, Ms. Lennon was elected to serve, let her serve, and if that's the case, I think we should let Caitlin continue to serve as well. Second issue, uh, to lead off on, it has to do with the firing range committee. Chapter 4 of the Boards and Commissions, Section 4-1-4, states that no member of any board, commission, or committee shall introduce, speak, or vote on any motion or issue in which he, has a, he or she has a conflict of interest, direct or indirect. My concern about the uh, Firing Range Committee and its expectations going forward is that right now, as co presently constituted, the entire committee has a conflict of interest. 
for example, um, the, on the committee is Mark Mayone, who's the former president of the gun club. And uh, the rain, uh, Ben Marciso, the range uh, uh, training officer, whatever part of his livelihood is based on that. And even Kathy Klein, who is an independent member at large, uh, funded uh, a study of legal issues regarding the gun club. So I think for all of those reasons, we need to take a look at the Constitution, what constitutes a firing range committee, and how do we go about having a committee put together that does not have all these built-in conflicts of interest, especially where uh, the president of the gun club is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight on any items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you. Town manager's monthly report. You know, due to the weather, I'll, we'll go a report. And I know we have a lot of folks waiting for other items. Thank you. Next item is the review of the draft minutes of January 4th, 2016. Do I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Yes, Jessica Sullivan. Yes, I move we approve <coughs> the minutes of uh, January 4th, 2016. Thank you, sir. Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 33-2016, Rudy's annual licenses. It's proposed to approve the annual malt, divinus, and spirituous license and special amusement permit. Is there a motion? Just a comment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Deborah Lane was away last week, and I was on, I didn't see the special amusement permit, but I was unsure. They, they did, in fact, not apply for that. So if someone makes a motion on that, you should not include the special abuse permit. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Is there a motion? Sure. Yes, Sarah Lynn. Um, I move we approve the annual <clears throat> malt, Venice, and spiritual license permit for Rudy's of the Cape at 517 Ocean House Road. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Penny. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you. We'll move on. Our next item is uh, the public hearing on the proposed Village Green Zoning Amendment. I'd like to again remind people if you're going to come up and speak to us tonight, please come up to the podium, speak into the microphone, give us your name and your address, please, and again, try to be respectful of our three-minute time limit. With that, the hearing is now open. Is there anyone who'd like to speak? Good evening, my name is Ann Carney. I live at 21 Angel Point Road. Um, and I'd like to speak about the um, proposed amendments related to the Village Green. And I just want to confirm that the proposal dated 1-13-16 is now the one that is subject to the hearing rather than the one that was before the Town Council previously, is that correct? The... Um Michael, would you like to Just, speak yeah. to that? The one that I was set for sure. public hearing is the, is the proposal that was presented in the recommendation from the planning board, uh, you know, a month or two ago. Came to the council, went to the ordinance committee. Okay, so it's the, the one that came out of the ordinance committee. That omits the, the um, mention of the 100 uh, yards of footage on Ocean House Road. Is that correct? It doesn't contain that? No. No. You know, there were two posted in the, the meeting yes. material. Yeah, there was talk of another amendment. No one has yet offered that amendment. It was included in the materials for the meeting. Uh, uh, council Lennon asked that, that, that it be included and distributed to the council, and it was posted. But it, it doesn't have any standing yet because no one has offered it as an amendment yet. Okay. <laughs> so the... the um the document that was on the website that's dated 925.15 is the one that's subject to the hearing? Correct. That was the one that was advertised for a public hearing. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. 
for the clarification. Um, I was under the impression that it was the other one, but I would like just to reiterate the concerns I had voiced previously about the um, September 25th, 2015 um, um, proposal, uh, which is that the, um, the, and I actually think it applies to the other one as well, but that the town council did a really nice job in adopting the design requirements that create more of a village feel along Route 77 by having the buildings in the front and the parking in the back. And I feel that um, actually both of these proposals, again, they, they kind of disrupt that uniformity that we had striven for in the previous amendments to the ordinance. And um, for example, we can see the effect of the ordinance in uh, buildings like the little deli near the high school. It does really, um, create and establish a warm feeling in the middle of our town. And I think that um, both the proposal that's currently before the council and the one that um, may be proposed as an amendment, my concern about those is that they disrupt that uniformity and that they also don't create standards that allow the town to um, exert enough control over the um, approval process that we as a town get what we want out of these town green type developments. In other words, I don't want us to surrender to developers all of the uniformity and care that we put into the original ordinance because whatever development happens is gonna be with our community for a really long time and we should just make, make sure that we get what we want out of this ordinance and I don't think either of those these proposals are quite there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Peter Curry. Uh, I live at Stony Brook Road and I'm chair of the planning board. Just want to say a few remarks in, uh, about the planning board's proposal. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on it and we tried very hard to recognize the interest of the town in a village green as expressed in the comprehensive plan and more recently in the town, uh, the town center district uh, report that came out two years ago. Um, so that, that has been the goal of coming up with something in that context that would be useful and meaningful to the town. And I thank the lady who just spoke for her comments about the zoning ordinance because that has a very definite scheme of a minimum maximum front yard which brings the, all the uh, the the developments the, the buildings up close to the street with a landscape frontage and the parking in the back and I think the sea salt market is a great example of that nothing in our proposal I don't think disrupts that and in fact it has makes a minor adjustment to accommodate because if you put in a village green on Ocean House Road as the uh, as the proposal uh, suggests the, the, the front yard requirement can't be met by the buildings that will frame the green as they would in a traditional village green layout. So it is a facilitative move that lets us adjust that front yard requirement to take into account the village green. The village green, in essence, becomes a front yard servicing the, the people of the town of Cape Elizabeth. So we, we think it's, uh, we also included some fairly rigid design requirements, another good point that was just made. So the uh, 20,000 square feet, minimum frontage, depth, uh, and it's part of the, the site plan review process. So the entire uh, design of the village green will be considered in connection with the site plan of the improvements that are being made to the adjoining parcel. Uh, we, we think this gives the town the best chance to come up with a first class, visibly nice village green in the center of town, which was our understanding of what you wanted. Um, uh, will comments be taken later on this, uh, the proposed amendment or the alternative? I do have some thoughts on that, but I'm happy to hold them until you consider that if you do. Um, <clears throat> I will probably allow that because I think it's helpful for us to have that. If we end up discussing that proposed amendment, then we'd probably take some additional comments. Okay, so we'll come back for that. Yes. Okay. Happy to take any comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sarbeck. I live at 60 Longfellow Drive in Cape Elizabeth. I'm also a member of the planning board um, with Peter. I just wanted to reiterate, um, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and I did sort of like the shore road path, the village green has been something that's been discussed since the early 90s and when the town center plan came up with their thoughts in 2014, I think it was item number four if I remember correctly was creating a village green along Route 77 ideally, I think that was a language that the town center plan or committee came up with in their plan. So. I would urge the council to adopt the uh, ordinance or the changes to the ordinance that the planning board came up with. Um, I have seen the other amendments. I won't go specifically into uh, any changes since that's not on the table at this moment. Um, but to me, Route 77 is basically Main Street in Cape Elizabeth. It has been for a long time. People who live off of Shore Road, off of Mitchell Road, I would think would share the feelings that when they're going to the high school, they go down Route 77. Scott Dyer's basically the way to the dump for them. I grew up off of Sawyer Road and I live in Elizabeth Park now, so Scott Dyer is very much, I travel it often, but to me, Route 77 would be the ideal place um, if this village green uh, was built. One of the things that I think the planning board took a lot of time with over a period of months was shaping the ordinance to sort of facilitate a trade if there was an owner of property that was going to sort of give the town what would turn out to, I believe, be 20,000 square feet, uh, feet of Village Green, basically in, uh, give it to the town to own, um, which is a huge dedication, a huge property, um, amount of property that somebody would be giving up in order to get sort of the setbacks, uh, I believe, changed by 10 feet. We thought that once the town had this village green, that they owned this village green, it would be something that would be a, a treasure to the community. And um, I would think that as the ordinance is written now, uh, addresses all of those concerns and goals that the town has in creating this village green for the town. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Seeing that no one else wants to speak, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you. And we will move on to our council item number 34-2016, the proposed zoning amendment related to a village green. Do we have a motion from a council member? Yes. Um, after a lovely discussion at last month's, no, sorry, December's Ordinance Committee uh, meeting and Peter from the Planning Board doing a wonderful job describing and explaining several times over and over repeated questions about this ordinance. I am pleased to move that we adopt the ordinance as it stands as we received it from the Planning Board and the Ordinance Committee approved. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Yes. A second. Thank you, Jessica. Is there any other discussion? Yes, sir. I'd just like to make a procedural clarification. I, I did not request the second one be in our packet. I simply pointed out that it wasn't there. It was my impression that at our former meeting, we all collectively agreed that it would be helpful to take a look at that language and have it available should we wish it at this public hearing. So I, I do not want my name on that request. I simply queried Mike why it wasn't there. And then without my requesting it, he put it he emailed it to everyone and put it on the website. So I'm feeling unfairly attacked here this evening, as you can tell. <laughs> so my name is not on the second thing being here, although I, I, I do remember all of us thinking it was a good idea, and I thank Caitlin and Maureen and Peter for meeting and carving that out. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, Kathy. So I'm confused. There was an um, item that was dated January 13th, 2016, that was in our packet. Um, I don't know why it was in our packet. Um, uh, Council Lennon says she didn't ask for it to be there, but it was. I spent a long time over the weekend um, studying it, not understanding what it was, and not understanding why it was there. So, oh, Caitlin's got her hand up, so I'm sure she'll explain, but um, I. So I guess I'm wondering why it was there, 
why it was in our packet, why we were expected to look at it as an alternative, um, and who requested it to be there, and who wrote it, um, and what is the, the reasoning behind the um, expectation. Yes, Caitlin. I can explain. At our meeting when we set the public hearing, we as a council discussed that there was another idea about having it on other roads other than Route 77. And then as a council, we also discussed how it is to our advantage to have materials prepared ahead of time so that we're not trying to make substantial changes to an ordinance on the fly, writing it down as we go at the public hearing. So it was agreed at our town council meeting that I would meet with Maureen and see if we could come up with something that we could work off of should the discussion tonight lead in the way that we wanted to make an amendment to the ordinance so that it wasn't just limited to Route 77. And then Peter joined Maureen and I for that meeting and we came up <coughs> with this language that would tweak it, but then once we got into our meeting, we realized that by expanding it beyond Route 77, it creates additional roads, but really the, the size of the property on those other roads would never be able to meet the 100-foot frontage requirements, so then some additional information needed to be given so that it would work if we wanted to go down that road. It was a created just so that should the council want to change the ordinance tonight, that there was already some vetting and some explanation and some research done so that we wouldn't be sitting here going, how are we going to handle this? And then it was decided, I believe, at the council meeting that it would be included so that people could review it ahead of time. I believe somebody actually requested it. I can't remember who requested that they be able to look at whatever language was created ahead of time. I would love to go back to the video and see, but I do remember somebody requesting that. So that was why we had the extra language in there, <clears throat> just in case. And it was inappropriate to share it with just the council and not put it in the packet if it was something that we were going to be reviewing. So it was included in the packet so that the whole town could look at it. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Um, unless we have anything else to discuss on that proposed language from January 13th, is there any other discussion specific to the amendment that is on the table right now and that we've had the motion and the second on? Yes, Jessica. Well, I'd like to add to what has just been said on this uh, other document um, with your permission. Yes, please. Um, I think that um, that we've had a what I see as a process problem and I think this was confusing in its, in its addition to our materials. I mean, I, I am looking at the email that Sarah Lennon asked that it be put in the meeting packet. Um, you know, the Ordinance Committee on December 17th unanimously uh, approved the December, the Planning Board's amendment. We went through it line by line. We had a detailed uh, presentation from Peter Curry, the Chairman of the Planning Board. And so, you know, it was, confusing to have uh, a change in, of heart by two ordinance committee members at that point, or later by January 4th. So what occurred between December 17 and January 4th, I, I'm at a loss to uh, understand. So I think that going forward, it would be uh, very important for counselors to be vigilant about the process in which, by which we deal with all of our issues so that we can have full transparency in our deliberation. Um, I, I understand what was likely behind this, but I think it was unfortunate in how it was handled. And um, so I, I would like to express that. I thank you. Yes. I, just, I think what I'm hearing this is, um, I. I was listening to what Caitlin said and remembering what went on in our meeting. I think there was a specific request for it to be done in this way, and then it didn't show up. I, for one, got to say that I was like, where was that other green, as they named it, Green Village um, 
portion of it. So, because I thought there was going to be dialogue potentially about that. I think we have to assume that with us as a council, our intentions are right, and we just had a, a wrong outcome in this in this um, particular case here. And I think it's really important that we, that we, as we work together, we're all in this community, that we look at, again, the intention was correct and right and that the outcome was wrong. And that's what I think we, if we want to delve into, and I could give you five points of why I think that this other amendment um, is the wrong thing for our community. And that the proposed Village Green Amendment as it stands is the right way, you know, for many, many reasons. Um, and I don't know if I need to give that background right now, but. Um, I guess I would just want to um, say that I, I think it's important that we look at that this was an opportunity for dialogue. Thank you. Yes, Kathy. Um, I'm not completely um, satisfied with the answers. Um, there was a uh, proposal made by two counselors, and I, for one, did not agree that it needed to be changed. Um, I want to know who wrote this proposal. Um, apparently, nobody seems to want to take ownership of this, and I want to know who wrote it. Yes, Maureen wrote it, because in our last council meeting, maybe we need to tee up the video and watch what happened. The council as a whole agreed that it, exactly what Caitlin said, it would be helpful to have specific language should we want to look at it. We then all tasked Caitlin, as the chair of ordinance, to go back, meet with Maureen again, and see if they could tweak the language. It turns out tweaking wasn't possible, but that was the intent. Could they tweak the language so that it would include the possibility of allowing more than one property to have this option to have a village green? Because we all agreed, all three of us, Jessica, in the ordinance committee meeting, that if this was a great idea for one, why not broaden it out to have more? That you know we could have more than one village green. This wasn't exclusive. I believe you yourself said that. So we tasked Caitlin to go back to Maureen which she readily agreed to do. They, they followed the instructions of the council as a whole. And then I, like Patty, had heard that people would want to look at that. I can imagine if we didn't share it with everyone that that would be a big problem too. So I, again, I'm, 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 I'm quite perplexed by um, people's lack of trust. And you know, you gotta, you gotta assume best intent. I, I'm actually dumbfounded that Caitlin's getting pounded on for this. She, she, she went the extra mile to do what we requested her to do. And Maureen was the one who drafted the actual language. Thank you. I'm going to take two more comments because I see there are two hands raised. I see Caitlin and Kathy both. I'm going to take Kathy first and then Caitlin if we're talking about process. And then I'd like to redirect our attention to the order of business at hand. I understand the concern for process and I certainly understand the concern that Jessica has expressed about following process and about transparency, and I want to make sure we are all very clear about that. Having said that, again, two comments, and then I want to get back to the issue at hand. Kathy. I would like to ask for Maureen to come up um, and indicate um, whether she wrote this or not. Um, yes, if you'd like to come up and speak to us. Good evening. Good evening. Um, in my opinion. Kathy, would you like to repeat that? Yes, please. Um, Maureen, I would like to ask if you wrote on page four, item four, um, which is part of the uh, January 13th, 2016 Green Village Ordinance Amendment. So there are two amendments before you. One is called the Village Green Amendment. That was prepared by the Planning Board, uh, recommended also by the Ordinance Committee, and then there's a second amendment called the Green Village Amendment. Uh, the Green Village Amendment was something I formatted. I did not draft it. I received language from Councillor Jordan. Um, we had a good discussion about potential shortcomings with that language, uh, but I was asked to prepare it, and I did. Thank you. Thank you. Caitlin, did you want to say something else, or did you have another question? My only comment was about including in the packet that if our discussion tonight had gone down that road, that I think our citizens would have been disappointed if all of a sudden we whipped out something that had been asked to be prepared and they hadn't seen it ahead of time. When we're talking about process and transparency, that's my only comment. Thank you. 
Okay, back on task on the proposed zoning. Yes, go right ahead. I, I want to comment on this as it's my, one of my responsibilities to decide what gets posted online. You know, I've been at this 30 odd years. If a counselor has ever asked, e either in the electronic age or before the electronic age, to forward something to the whole council, we do it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, every counselor has the right to do that, and it's a responsible thing to do because it also does add full transparency uh, in terms of making sure that other counselors in the public knows that maybe an amendment would come up. And when a citizen raised the issue earlier, uh, Ann Carney, it, it was asked, you know, what, what's, the, what's the actual public hearing? We clarified that. But, you know, I would hate to think we get into a situation where counselors can't ask us to distribute stuff to other counselors, either, you know, that relates to a meeting agenda item, either electronically or otherwise. And, you know, in, in this case, we, we got an email. Uh, it, it, it was requested by a counselor to, to, uh, to put, uh, oh, I thought we were just a few more steps, a few steps more along to avoid any online conversation. Should we just put both versions of the meeting packet? That's what we did. I, I don't see any harm with it. I, I think everyone should know what should possibly come up, you know, if things are floating about. And I think other, you know, I, I agree with what Caitlin said. Otherwise, you know, I don't think we would be practicing transparency. So I, I would just hate to leave a message to, you know, unless you want to give that message, that's fine. But, you know, if, if you're only going to let the manager decide what goes in the packet, and counselors aren't going to have the right to put stuff there as well. I think that's way too much authority to the town manager, and uh, the council, each each individually, should have that that right. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Yes, Jessica. One more comment. Uh, this is something that has not been raised, but just for the the public's clarification, this al this alternative amendment that was emailed to us six days ago had not been seen by the Ordinance Committee, had not been vetted by the Ordinance Committee. Just so that's clear. Thank you. Okay, back to the item I believe that is in front of us that has been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion about that proposed Village Green zoning amendment? <clears throat> yes. I would just like to thank again the uh, uh, hard work put in by the planning board. Um, they had four meetings, including a public hearing on this amendment. They spent a great deal of time and a great deal of thought in crafting it, and I, I would like to thank them for all that effort. That's great. I would second that, and I would also say the same to the folks on the Ordinance Committee. I know there's been a lot of work done on this, and I know there has been a fairly long and extensive public process with input from a number of people. We appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? Yes? All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. That motion passes 6-1. Great. <clears throat> we will move on to item number 35-35. 2016, the Fort Williams Park group use requests for 2016. Mike, you'll introduce that? I'd be happy to, and Bob Malley's here, who is the staff liaison to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. This uh, gives permission for Cape Elizabeth Little League, for Cape Elizabeth High School, for its rehearsals and commencement ceremony, for Family Fun Day, for the Beach to Beacon Road Race, and for the main chapter of the American Cancer Society, Breast Cancer, uh, awareness to for a 5k road race all to utilize Fort Williams for large group uses in 2016. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a motion for this item? Yes, Patty. Um, I move that we um, approve Fort Williams Park group um, use request for 2016. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll Jessica. second. Thank you. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? Nope, that's unanimous. We'll move on to item number 36, 2016, the proposal, <clears throat> excuse me, to engage James Safian as bond counsel. Mike, you'll introduce this one too? Yes, the, one of the town council's responsibilities within the charter is to appoint attorney or attorneys 
for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, one of those attorneys is the bond counsel. Uh, Bruce Cogsall has been a long, long time bond counsel, actually taken the place of a gentleman named Charlie Allen, Tom Allen's father. Some of you remember mm -hmm. Congressman Tom Allen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, P.S. Atwood has been a bond counsel for generations, and Jim Safian is now the lead bond counsel at P.S. Atwood, and I would recommend that he be uh, appointed to be the successor bond counsel. Thank you. Is there a motion? Thank you, Kathy. Hi. Um, I would like to um, move that we accept James Safian as bond counsel, um, uh, replacing Bruce Cogsall, that we would like to thank very much for his service for 30 years as our bond counsel. Thank you. Is there a second? Jessica? Was that a second? Yes? Yes, okay. okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Checking. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? Any comments or questions from Mike? I'll just say he appears to be highly qualified and highly competent. <clears throat> All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. We'll move on. <laughs> Item number 37. <clears throat> Excuse me. The proposal to bond improvements to the recycling center. Mike, you'll introduce this item too. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Gosling. Mm -hmm. This item uh, would authorize the expenditure of up to $1.4 million for improvements and upgrades to the town's recycling center in the issuance of bonds. It is subject to a proposed citizen vote in June of this year as the charter provides any expense over $1 million. Uh, it needs to be uh, reviewed and considered by the voters. Uh, the bond council recently appointed uh, has drafted a bond resolution for your consideration. Uh, the town council's had a couple of different workshops on this, receiving the report of the long range solid waste uh, study committee and uh, you had a public hearing last month on it as well and mm -hmm. asked that it be put off to this month uh, to actually prepare the bond resolution and is now before you for consideration. Thank you for that. Is there a motion for this item? Yes, Jessica. Thank you for that privilege, Chair McCausland. <laughs> yes. I move that we approve the proposed bond for the pool. Um, good grief. Jump <laughs> Almost. Ahead of We're not quite there yet. <laughs> I move that we propose that we approve the, uh, the proposal to bond improvements to the recycling center. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, Jamie. I second. Thank you. Any discussion? Any comments? Yes, Caitlin. Um, my only comment is that I will be voting for the bonding um, for this, but I don't want it to lead people to think that it's my approval of the Recycling Center plan, just that I don't want, should the voters vote to approve this in June, I don't want this to be held up by delaying it in any way, so approving the bond ahead of time. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Unanimous. Thank you. And thank you for that motion, Jessica. And we'll move on to number 30. It was. <laughs> we'll move on to number 38, the proposed bond for pool improvements to humidity control system and disinfectant system at the Don Richards Community Pool. Mike, would you like to say anything about that? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman McCausland. Uh, this item would authorize expenditures up to $700,000 to replace the humidity control unit at the Donald Richards Community Pool and also for a new disinfectant system. Uh, the town council began to discuss this as a finance committee uh, last April, uh, looked at some short-term solutions, uh, thought it was more important to look at it long-term since the humidity control unit had been failing and was showing that it needed, uh, needed quite a bit more work than just a temporary fix. Uh, further, throughout the process, a number of folks indicated concern with the chlorine uh, levels in the Donald Richards pool and wanted us to look at alternatives to, to uh, the maintenance of the pool water by, by chlorine. Uh, Greg uh, Marles, the, the facilities manager, uh, worked with Harriman Associates, uh, who were the original designers of the pool. Uh, as you know, the, the pool that's now there and, and this equipment, and uh, has come forward with a new system that will 
reduce the chlorine about up to 90 percent. So it will make for a much more enjoyable pool experience for individuals. Uh, it'll, it'll replace uh, outdated equipment. Because this is under a million dollars, the final vote uh, is up to the town council and it, it would not uh, specifically uh, go to the voters uh, for approval under the charter. And Greg is here if you have technical questions because I'm not the technical guy on this. Understood. Thank you. Is there a motion for this item? Jessica? <laughs> when I tried to make <laughs> earlier. I, I move that we uh, approve the proposed bond for pool improvements to humidify to the, to the humidity control system and disinfectant system at the Donald Richards Community Pool. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Patty. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion and any questions for our facilities director, Greg Marles? Yes. I just wanted to thank uh, Greg for his presentation to us recently at our workshop. Um, and um, this is a big ticket item, but this is a, what I view as a vital community asset. And um, pools are very expensive. That's just the way they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's wise to be proactive on what is actually happening with that uh, in that engineering system. So I uh, am very much in favor of approving this. Thank you. Yes, Kathy. At the risk of sounding like I'm repeating myself, I'd like to thank Greg as well. Um, we had some questions for him. Um, it's expensive, but I also think about um, that the senior citizen groups like it. The young children like it and everybody in between. Um, and it's been a very popular item for years and years. Um, so um, as much as I'd like it to be $10,000, I recognize that it is not. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Any questions for Greg? No? Are we ready to vote? All in favor? None opposed. Thank you. That was unanimous. We're keeping you busy, I know. Good. That's good. Good attitude. All right. We'll move on to item number 39-2016, and this is the approval of the warrant and ballot question. And Deb, I think you'll be introducing this item. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this is the warrant for the June 14th election which would not only include the town uh, recycling center referendum, but also the school budget validation referendum. Um, the warrant is posted in the town in various places at least seven days prior to an election. It also will include a specimen ballot uh, when it is posted as well. Um, just so everyone knows, the school budget questions would be uh, the approval of the school budget uh, validation referendum the non-binding expression of opinion for the uh, school budget, too high, acceptable, or too low. And also this year, uh, voters will be voting whether or not to continue the budget validation referendum process. If you recall, by state law, the voters vote on that every three years. Again, it would be whether to continue the validation referendum. If it's voted down, um, then the process would return to uh, the town council having final approval of the of the school vote. So again, this is a uh, time to do that again. And then the recycling center question, uh, shall the council uh, vote the expenditure of up to 1.4 million for improvements and upgrades to the town's recycling center be approved? There is a treasurer's statement included as well, uh, and then the absentee ballot processing information is recruited by law. This warrant was prepared uh, by myself in concert with attorneys Leahy, Safian uh, and the town manager. So everyone has signed off on it. There were several iterations of it uh, just to make sure that everything was included. Uh, also, you'll see that we'll use the warrant to um, also produce the ballots as well. So uh, this uh, warrant is uh, ready for the council approval this evening. Thank you. Could I have a motion for approval of this warrant and ballot question as it's explained and written in our agenda tonight? So moved. Oh. Uh -oh. Thank you. Kathy? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or are there any questions? No? All in favor? That's unanimous. And we will move on. 
And we'll move on to item number 40, which is the proposed grant for the paving of Two Lights Road. Mike, I think this is your item to introduce. Yes. Yeah, this is a program, uh, thank you, that PAX mm -hmm. has that occasionally we can get some money to pay half the cost of paving certain uh, roads that are within the PAX system. One of those roads is Two Lights Road. Uh, Bob has prepared the grant application, and I'm pleased that they have awarded it. Uh, uh, subject to the town uh, agreeing to the partnership agreement, and it, this is a 242,000 up to 242,000 dollar project. Uh, the state would pay 50 percent. We would pay 50 percent. If any, if it ended up costing over 242, which we don't expect, we would pay 100 percent of any overage. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion for this item number 40, the proposed grant for the paving of Two Lights Road? Thank I you. so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? Any questions for Mike? And we have Bob Malley here tonight if anyone has any questions for him as well. No? And I have one question. The timing on that, Bob? You can come up and speak. That would be great. Um, it's our hope for an early spring. Uh, you wouldn't know it. We're looking outside tonight. Uh, Isn't but we'd that like what to the Grand House told us it was going to be in early spring? That's correct. Uh, we'd like to do it before Memorial Day, if at all possible, just to avoid the crowds with the restaurant down at uh, the Lobster Shack. But uh, if not, we hope to do it before June 15th. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, quick question. Is, is this the same type of project that was done on Mitchell Road last year? Yes. It would be, be a shim and an overlay. A one day. Kind of Depending on the weather, <laughs> <Two days. laughs> yeah. sometimes it can be two or three. So. Not all summer. No, Time not at the all. They arrive. Yeah, that too. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay. All in favor? Any opposed? No. Nope. That passes unanimously. Thank you. And we will move on to item number. 41-2016, this one also has your name on it. I think Bob will let Mike introduce them. Yeah. The, the truck that plows, among other things, the town hall, the Thompson Memorial Library lot, the fire station lot, the fire, the police station lot, and odds and ends of the school grounds, uh, has developed cracks in its frame. And if you know anything about trucks, when they develop cracks in their frame, that's not good. Uh, you really have to take it out of service. It, it becomes dangerous. The truck is only about eight years old, seven years old. So, you know, it's uh, about eight years old. Uh, you know, not, you know, a lo you know, it's longer than we would usually keep trucks, you know, 20 years. So uh, this, is, this is highly unusual. I, it's a very unusual circumstance. You know, I've never, ever come to the light, to the council uh, asking for a truck out of schedule. I think this is a particularly unique circumstance uh, because you know these these cracks just happen, and uh, I, I do think it's a, it's extraordinary and it should be considered. Uh, the cost to replace the truck is fifty five thousand two fifty, and that includes the the the, the, the chassis, the dump body, some warning lights, uh, some frame supports, some some rear fenders. Uh, you know, we looked at other options of you know, maybe deferring this or deferring that. And no, but yet knowing the pressures that are on the capital improvement plan in, in the upcoming budget and beyond, it just didn't strike me that that was, I didn't want to get further behind the, the eight ball in, in terms of those projects. So, uh, you know, Bob and I looked at this and uh, we, we are recommending uh, that it be replaced at the cost of 55250 and that the funds come from the unassigned fund balance. So this is, in essence, a new appropriation. Unlike the, the last one, two lights rotating from existing appropriation, this is a new appropriation. Bob is here to answer any technical questions. OK. Or non-technical. Right. Could I have a motion on this item? Jessica. I, I move that we approve the truck replacement. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty, thank mm -hmm. you. Second. Any discussion? Do we have questions? Caitlin. Um, is there a disadvantage to trying to file a claim? I, I see that it says that it might be denied, or, or at the best case, they might give you book value. I mean, 
Is there a negative to trying for it? Uh, they just didn't seem positive that they would approve the claim, that they would deny it, based on the fact that there wasn't a date of the damage, it wasn't involved in a vehicular accident. So they weren't, they didn't provide any good information or positive information that they would approve the claim. The, I mean, you speak of evidence that it's happened in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe there's something that needs to be investigated as to a flaw in that right. and there are, So I was just wondering if there's a reason why we're not at least, I mean, even if we approve to buy one, if we still can't file a claim and recoup something back, I was just wondering what the negative was to trying. Um, we can always try. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jessica. I had a question, uh, thank you, um, about um, warranties, uh, chassis. I mean, uh, maybe for trucks, they're different than from cars, but I, I imagine you've explored that, but as this is a pretty young vehicle. Generally, when we purchase equipment, we always specify a five-year warranty, so we always specify a 60-month, which is an extended warranty. We're beyond that. And there have been other issues. Uh, other communities have had similar issues, so uh, we don't know if there's a design flaw, but there's been no recall from General Motors or anything related to that, so. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Jamie? I just wanted to clarify, this is for new purchase? This is not for used? That's correct. And is there much of a market for pre-owned or? Uh, for the used unit or? Yeah. Uh, there may be. It actually has more value. We looked at actually purchasing just a cab and chassis and reusing the dump body, uh, but the truck probably has more value with the dump body on it. You'd also then have a new truck with a used body that you'd have to replace before the truck reaches the end of its useful life. So it actually has more value the way it is right now with the engine and the transmission being in good shape. Right. Is there much market for a used entire Set up as well. uh, no, but there may be some leftover units. There may be a unit that someone has on a lot that's not the right paint code or paint color that could be painted where we could achieve some savings. Other questions? I guess my only question is, is there, even though the, um, the chassis is cracked or um, and broke, is there some value left in the truck that you could unload it and either trade it in or get some value out of it? We would, we would actually, part of the bidding process, we would uh, request that that be as a trade-in for the new truck. So this number, the $55,000 is an up to amount and there could be trade in value against it's, that. The value is, the, 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 hope, the hope is expectation would be less than this. And there's a potential for an insurance claim as Potentially, well. Potentially, we can ask, we can inquire, we can file a claim. Okay, other comments or questions? No? Great, all in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. No? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to item number 42, Harbor Master Services. Mike, you'll introduce this item. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, Chief Williams uh, oversees our Harbor Master responsibilities. And, you know, for, for some time, you know, we don't really feel as though we've been providing the level of service that we would like to. Uh, our Harbor Master doesn't have a boat. Uh, he, uh, you know, I, I, he, there just seems to be a better way to do it. One of the council goals for this year was to explore, you know, cooperative arrangements, working with other communities to provide different services. Uh, the town of Scarborough, uh, har existing harbor master, uh, just uh, retired or resigned. Retired? Uh, I don't know his age. Uh, just left. Uh, and they're in the process of hiring a new harbor master, so it seemed to be a good time to explore with them the possibility. Uh, so the way this would work is that, you know, if you approve this in concept this evening, uh, we, we would then go back to Scarborough, work out an interlocal agreement, uh, would then bring back to you the specific appointment of a harbor master since, uh, you know, I, I believe in, in the state rules that the municipal offices have the responsibility for actually appointing the harbor master, but basically we would move from a very part-time harbor master uh, to sharing uh, Scarborough's harbor master, and they would provide about 155 hours of service. Uh, the cost would be approximately $1,500 more than the current service, uh, but we believe the service would be immensely improved uh, in terms of the, the professional experience and knowledge of, of working uh, with moorings and other issues, the, 
the, the person you know, who Scarborough works for also is the clam warden and you know, has a few other uh, marine resource officer responsibilities and is also a, a sworn police officer, uh, which also, you know, we, we don't have those problems, but nonetheless, it's, it's not bad to have some. I would recommend that you, you uh, approve uh, moving forward with this arrangement uh, with Scarborough with the understanding that we'll bring back to you a, uh, a uh, interlocal agreement and a, uh, an actual appointment of the harbor master. I don't know the name of the new individual that they've hired, uh, but uh, I think overall it's, it's a good way to go uh, when you know, we're just not big enough that we can attract a harbor master and supply the harbor master uh, with all the, the resources that they'd like to have and by working with Scarborough we're, we're, we're able to provide a much better service to the citizens and, uh, of Cape Elizabeth and those that are interested in, in our harbors and uh, mooring areas. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes, Jamie. I move that we uh, accept the uh, proposed harbor master arrangement and uh, give Mike the authority to negotiate that with Scarborough. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty? Thank I'll second you. that. Thank you. Any discussion? Public comment? And do we take public comment oh, yeah. first or council member comment I'll first? Take or it do, the public first. do we have someone from the public who'd like to come up and speak? Yeah. Yes. Please come right up to the podium. Give us your name and your address. Uh, my name is Nate Perry, uh, 10 Pine Ridge Road. I maintain two moorings and uh, also a limited purpose aquaculture license in Kettle Cove, which is issued by the State Department of Marine Resources. And I would ask, I know that there's some, a lot of considerations, I'm assuming, that went into planning this, but I would ask that, uh, that this deal be finalized after the mooring holders have had a chance to think this over and actually uh, take into consideration other possible alternatives or options or see how this would actually work, uh, maybe some of the details, because uh, in talking with some folks today, I don't think, uh, at least from the commercial side of things, nobody really kn knew that this was going to happen. The gentleman's name who was hired in Scarborough, uh, Ian Anderson, um, sort of worked under the former guy, uh, uh, Dave Corbeau, who was uh, who retired last spring. I think it was going into the summer. Anyway, um, and uh, I, I do personally see some value, not knowing, again, the, the uh, municipal and financial side of stuff as well as you guys would, but I do uh, see a value uh, that's very considerable in having somebody with some local knowledge. Maybe it, it'll be a, a case where we don't necessarily find that perfect person uh, to do that job. But I think it should be looked at before, I mean, I don't know how the process works. If it's going to move to a vote, it's going to happen anyway. But I think, uh, I think that maybe the mooring holder should have a little more notification uh, and a chance to uh, mull this one over before it could be completely out of their hands. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Jody Jordan, 83, Old Ocean House Road. I've had a mooring down to Seal Cove there since 1980, 1978. I really would appreciate what Nate has asked you if you would try to find a local person that would be a harbor master. That I'm probably just old school. I just like to keep everything in the town if we could. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Edward Perry. I live at 10 Pine Ridge Road in Cape Elizabeth. I have a mooring down to Kettle Cove. Um, I've been a commercial fisherman for 40 years. Uh, I think um, those people who have worked at the Cove or have had a boat at the Cove, whether commercial or recreational, uh, we've had a challenging couple of years as far as working with the mooring situation. 
uh, not so much challenge with the moorings, but it was basically a communication challenge, and uh, we're just hoping that uh, that doesn't happen again, that we get somebody from someplace else that, you know, it, it's very difficult to communicate with. And, and like Jody and Nate, uh, nobody knew about this. When I called some people this afternoon, they had no idea this was going on, and they wanted to put some input in, but it uh, didn't sound like it was really an appropriate time. And we'd hope that maybe you could postpone it one month and send an email to mooring owners so that they could have some input in the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask you one quick question? Yes. Can you g give me an idea of how much um, interaction or engagement you have with the harbor master as a, a mooring holder? The past harbor master? Uh, well, we sent him numerous letters and got no response. I send my money in. I assume I have a mooring because the town cashed my check for two years in a row. So I had nothing to do with him. He told me my mooring was illegal and that I needed to take it out. He told my son he needed to get his aquaculture stuff out. And, you know, we need somebody we can just talk to. And uh, I, I, if you do the math here, uh, the person is going to spend five and a half hours a week here for half a year. Uh, that does sound like, you know, enough time to do things, especially since it also says that uh, it sounds like the town of Cape Elizabeth will handle all the paperwork, the billing and sending out information and so on. So it could be a, a good deal for everybody. And as Mike McGovern says, it, it seems to make sense. They provide the boat. They provide the fuel. It could, it could work. But we really, I think everybody would feel much better if they just had a chance to put some input or hear more about it before it was voted on in a done deal. Otherwise, it's, oh, it's another done deal, and let's see if we can live with it. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> yes, Caitlin. Oh, just for transparency, I mean, obviously, my family members and lots of them have moorings in Cape Elizabeth. I do not, but um, just to put it out there, I don't feel as though it affects my decision as to who to hire for a harbor master, but I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Jamie? Um, thank you for your comments. It's very appreciated um, as you're very close to the issue. Um, as a point of um, procedure, I guess I would say that I believe that there would be ample citizen opportunity for comment um, more specific to the, the individual and the arrangement when that person, when we go further in the process to actually approve the appointment. So all we're talking about doing here today is moving forward with um, some negotiation on whether or not this would be the type of arrangement we would want to move forward with. Is that Mike, correct? Mike, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Y yes. You know, the, the thinking is, is you know, we, we need to really talk with Scarborough, get a, get a little more specifics, uh, and, uh, you know, come back with an interlocal agreement that, that, that spells out the situation. I think, I, think, I think the interlocal agreement is more important than the actual person, because persons do come and go. Right. Uh, you know, what you're really looking at is the arrangement of, you know, do you want us to be providing this service through a full-time person in the neighboring community, or do you wish us to keep the, the part-time uh, system that uh, I don't think is, personally has worked well in recent years? So I think that we would, um, again, have that opportunity for additional comment. And I know that I, and I imagine I speak for everybody here, would welcome that additional comment, too. So um, please do bring it forward when, when that time comes about. Um, I just wanted to add that um, I've definitely been a big proponent of um, uh, you know, community shared resources. Uh, I've talked about that with some of you, some people in the community. Um, one of the things I think that is interesting about this is that Oftentimes when we talk about shared resources, we're talking about lowering costs. And as Mike pointed out, we're not necessarily lowering costs here, but um, you know, another objective is getting better service, which definitely uh, appears to be um, a clearly met objective with this arrangement. Um, so I think this is a, a, a terrific idea to explore further and hopefully um, put into place. 
Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. I was going to say similar along those lines. One of my goals for this year was to look at ways to combine resources and, and save money. And so in this instance, we're not saving any money. And one of the arguments is that, you know, this way we would have a harbor master who has his own boat. And I do remember several years ago appropriating funds for the current harbor master to purchase a boat through the town, and that never occurred. So I'm just saying we did put those things out there and they didn't get followed through. So it's not that the town is incapable of providing such resources that just never happened. I, I just would hate to see us close the, the door on something that has worked for how many years up until our most current harbor master who decided to take things in a different direction that didn't quite work out with those that are using the moorings. Um, I'd also ask that if we're going to move forward, one of the other goals that we've been having as a council is making more people of specific interest aware of topics and um, moorings, we have lists, we have addresses, we have email addresses. There's no reason why we can't send out a specific notice to these individuals to let them know that we'll be discussing this further. I was surprised that that wasn't brought up for tonight since this was really brought out of the blue to many of the members of our community that have moorings. So I would propose and like to see that happen if we're going to be having a further discussions and see this on a, a future agenda. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. Um, I just have a suggestion. It sounds like legitimately these folks would like to be in on the conversation about who gets hired rather than saying, okay, we're going to vote to hire them and then afterward sort of let them know. Or It's not just giving information. They want to be part of the process. So would it be possible, Mike, if we vote this in for the harbor, all the people who own moorings to maybe choose three or four people who could meet with you and this new person and ask the questions of their concerns. Like, will you check in? Will you be available? I don't know. They could meet each other and at least be part of the process. You know, uh, through the chair, please. You know, I, I would ask the chief of police who oversees the program uh, to do that. Uh, to you know, and I would limit it to four. Anyone who wishes to to be whatever, yeah. Uh, you know, and if they wanted to have, you know, we don't have a say on who the harbor master specifically is that Scarborough hires. They've already made that decision, but but I'd have be had. I'm not sure when the person starts it. But I'd be happy to work with the chief for him to facilitate a meeting uh, for everyone to meet the gentleman or woman, whatever it may be, whoever it may be. And uh, well, you said it was Ian. Ian, it's a man. Yeah. 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 And uh, to to move forward and meet that person and have a discussion. You know, I think one of the issues though is you know I uh, you know I don't want to blame this on the just the current harbor master. My sense is this program hasn't worked well for dozens of years. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've never been pleased with, with this program and it's supposed to be an enforcement program and yes, we're supposed to have local knowledge, but in the end it's an enforcement program. Uh, it's, it's a safety program to make sure that the, the, the moorings are where they're supposed to be. Uh, you know, I think, you know, that we, we, you know, we've had people not paying their mooring fees for whatever reasons, I'm unsure. Uh, and, you know, I, I, we need a little bit more uh, rigor in this program. And, you know, I think everyone needs to understand that, you know, the systems that we've had that have been very unclear processes has to end. And I, I think by working with a full-time harbor master, uh, you know, we, we're going to have a, a harbor program that follows the ordinances of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and that should be everyone's understanding going forward, whether or not we contract with Scarborough or we, or we uh, you know, hired someone, you know, who, who's an existing, you know, mooring holder. But, you know, my, my, my inclination is not to have an enforcement position with someone who has an individual stake in in the in the uh, in the program, and you know we've had a number of harbor masters. They've all been good people, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know I and I don't want to stop mentioning names, but I think we 
we could, you know, we've always had someone's brother or someone's, you know, we had Clarence Schwartz a long time ago, nice guy, uh, we, I won't mention all the other names in between, but I think we, we need more rigor in the program and we need to make sure that the ordinances are being followed. Thank you. Any other comments? And, and I think this is one way to accomplish that and probably one of, probably the best way. Any other comments from any other council Just members? One. Yes, Caitlin. That I believe another one of my goals this year was to review um, the harbor study that was done back in the 80s. I think that it might have a good, it might be a good idea to look at the harbor ordinance as well, considering that the way our ordinance is written now, there isn't much for standards or, or rules to follow. The harbor master gets to make them up and set them. And so that might be where some of the concern comes from is who is going to be the harbor master because it's not like they just enforce rules, they get to create them and enforce them. Okay, Kathy? Um, I'm gonna support this um, first step. Um, I think that it's important um, for the reasons that Michael suggested. I also think it's important because we currently have a problem that we are waiting to hear back from the state and, and this continues to be an issue. Um, and um, I know the counselors are aware of this because I called them and told them about it. So um, I think we need somebody who knows how to do their job. Now, whether that's the individual that Scarborough was hired or, or not, I don't know, but um, I think that we take the first step because for any of the issues, I think that we need to have somebody who knows what to do, knows to do, how to do their job, and they, don't, and they do it. So I will support this. Thank you. <clears throat> Jessica? I'm sitting here listening to all of this, and uh, Council Jordan mentioned her uh, many family moorings and uh, basically was telling us that she, she does not feel she has a conflict of interest, but as I'm sitting here absorbing all this, I had a thought which I think the council needs to entertain. And that is, should Councilor Jordan recuse herself from Harvard Master discussions, given her involvement with this um, overriding a Harbor Master's uh, permit application for a, an individual in Cape Elizabeth, and, and the resulting issues with that. It may be that the council should consider that as a possible recusal on this issue, anything to do with the Harbor Master Services, given what has occurred. Thank you. Um, I have a question on a point of order. Are you making a request? And my question about point of order is then, do we need a second on that request, or that is it a motion for recusal? I would say I think the proper procedure may be that I make a point of order, which I shall make, and um, move to consider that recusal as a point of order, which I think takes precedence over motion on the table, but Mike McGovern may know better than that. I don't know. You know, I, what I just heard Councilor say is that she, she moved to consider whether or not there's a recusal. She didn't, she didn't, that was it. Okay. And so, you know, if she's right making a motion to consider something, I'm not sure what that does, okay. but at the, the very least, you'd, you'd need, I think you'd need a second for that. Are you looking to make a motion to consider, or are you making a motion to ask for recusal? Why don't I just make a motion to ask for recusal, and then if there's a second, then the conversation would then take place? Yes. Second. Kathy? You have a second. Thank you. Any discussion? No? No? Would, would yes. through the chair, would Council Jordan tell us what she thinks? Um, I don't think I have any conflict of interest in the matter. I think I um, did something several years ago that I did not at the time think was inappropriate or wrong. Um, somebody 
came to me and asked if I, as a town official, could sign um, a piece of paper to move an application forward through the chain of command at the state level, and I did so. And it's come back now, years later, saying that I sh didn't have the authority to sign such paper. I really don't think it has anything to do with the moving forward with hiring a new harbor master at this point. Um, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Any discussion? Are we ready to vote on the motion on the floor, which is to uh, ask the councillor to recuse from this discussion about the harbor master? All those in favor of asking for the recusal? Opposed? Do I vote? I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can vote, but. She yes, you can. Not I think recused you can. Yes. Not recused yet, exactly. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that motion does not pass. So now we're back to discussing the item number 42, the Harbor Master Services. Is there any other discussion about the item on the table right now? The item we're discussing. No? Yes, Caitlin. Can I just have a clarification question. Is it possible to know if the mailings to or the emailings or some kind of notification is going to be going to future to the mooring holders as we move forward. I mean, do we need to make that into a motion or is that can we just nod that? from Mike that that's going to happen or I, I'm happy to answer that question. But first, what, what's the motion on the table? The, who me? Jamie. 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 Jamie and Patty seconded to authorize the town manager to negotiate with the towns of Scarborough and bring back an interlocal agreement and appointment of a harbor master. You're really good. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, so I understand what the motion is. You know, there's nothing in conflict with that motion to the, the, the idea of having a, a meeting that the police chief would convene uh, with all the mooring holders. We can send out a, you know, if we have the email list, I presume we do, but I'm not sure. It's one of the issues. Uh, uh, then uh, we'll uh, we'll send out a notice and have a meeting before this comes back to the council. Thank you. I think that's helpful. I would like to thank the three of you for showing up tonight and giving us your input. And I do think it is helpful if you want to participate further in the discussions that we've been talking about tonight. Um, at this point, I think we are ready to take a vote on that item number 42. All those in favor of the motion that Deb just read to us? Any opposed? No? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Again, thank you for coming tonight. We will move on to item number 43, the confirmation of community, <clears throat> excuse me, community services becoming a municipal department. Mike, this one has your name next to it again. Yeah, I did. the council's uh, very familiar with this issue. You've had a, a couple of workshops, one individually, one with the school board, and it's proposed for you to confirm that community services will become a municipal department effective July 1, and to request uh, the town manager to present a proposed community service budget for the upcoming fiscal year to the town council concurrent with the presentation of the municipal budget. Wonderful, and as you said, we've been discussing this for the last to meetings, and do we have a motion on the table, or do we have a motion from a council member? Yes, Sarah. I move um, that we confirm that community service will become a municipal, municipal department effective July 1st, 2016, and request the town manager to present the proposed community service budget for the fiscal year 2017 to the town council concurrent with the presentation of our municipal budget. Thank you. Is there a second? Jamie, thank you. I second. Great. Any discussion? Yeah, I would like to say this gets the budget started, but we also would be coming back at some point with an amendment to the administrative code that specifically sets up the language to provide that it's a department. Uh, that, but and, and you know, secondly, we're still awaiting the school board's Correct. vote on that. So that before we begin to actually amend language, uh, 
uh, we want to make sure that they're on board as well. Right. And the school board, I believe, will be voting on this tomorrow night. Any other comments, questions, any more discussion on that item? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? That passes unanimously. We move on to item number 44, the former Thomas Memorial Library Building. And Mike, you'll give us the introduction to this one, item as well. And this is, in fact, now the former Thomas Memorial Library Building. <laughs> yes. And it's proposed to form a four-member committee consisting of two school board members and two members of the council to review reuse proposals for the former, former Thomas Memorial Library. That this is a charge that is not intended to be limit, limited. It's to review reuse proposals for the former Thomas Memorial Library. It does not indicate that there can only be ones that are on the table now if the committee wishes to look at whatever other proposals, they, they certainly within their charge to do that. Uh, the committee would report, is suggested a report back by May 9th, that's so that it sort of links in with the budget process so it mm -hmm. doesn't go into the summer. And, you know, if the committee feels that, you know, they need a, an architect or, a, you know, some structural issue to be looked at, it provides that we would, we would continue to set aside $25,000 from an existing appropriation in the library building improvement account and that those funds I would make available to the committee uh, upon request. Thank you. Do we have a motion for that item? Caitlin, yes. I move that we form, this committee doesn't have a name, the, this committee, the review proposals for the new use of the former Thomas Memorial Library building. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion? Kathy. Um, it, it bothers me a tiny bit that we um, have uh, that we have a committee made up of two town councilors and two school board members. I don't have a problem with the town councilors, but I wonder about the school board members if they don't already have um, uh, because they have an interest in the building. And should we not have some additional people on this committee? I'm not one of those people that wants big committees, believe it or not. But I am not sure if we are fully representing everybody who might have an interest in the building. I mean, we've seen the school board's proposal. And I sort of got the impression that the reason we were putting this committee together was to ferret out what the school board's proposal was. Because Can I just clarify for one yes. second? I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I need to clarify this with Mike. I'm, I believe that is a request from the school department, not from the school board. Is that correct? It came to us from the superintendent. Yeah, we already get tripped up on this once tonight on where something came from. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I got a memo from Meredith with a proposal. I do not know to the degree to which she reviewed it with the school board. She may or may not have, I don't know. Okay, thank you. I will go say ahead. the go school ahead. group, the school something, because um, the memo um, still is, has not been explained. So I thought that this group was to find out what the school's proposal was, but not necessarily to find out um, others who might be interested. So. I'm concerned that we're not necessarily um, really doing a good job at finding out um, other groups that might be interested in the building. So we have two school board members on the committee, and does that not sort of sound like we are sort of sending it their way anyway? I, I'm just I'm asking mm -hmm. the question. I, yeah. yes. uh, you know, because we still don't have an explanation. Yeah from that proposal that came from Meredith from the school something. You know, if I, Please. You know, the charge is written to review reuse proposals for the former Tosmore Library. We sent a survey out to about 4,000 residents on this topic. Uh, we have lots of different comments. We have lots of input that we can make available to this committee. Uh, you know, it's, it's really limitless. You know, I, I hear comments you know, like we haven't asked anyone and you know nothing could be further from the reality because you know in fact we, we did ask everyone we have hundreds of comments back uh, we we had articles in the Cape Courier uh, about this uh, in addition uh, so the, you know, there's a lot of input you know what 
what the committee, you know, makeup ought to be, that's up to the council. Uh, you know, I, I do point out that, you know, if you do want to add someone to the committee or a position to the committee, you know, you need to figure out as well who would appoint them. Are we going to go through the appointments committee process? If that's the case, this May 9th date is total fiction, mm -hmm. and you need to give consideration to, uh, you know, or do you want the council chairman to have the authority to appoint any vacancy? If I could just, any position? if I could just finish, finish I, I recognize that we did a lot of, um, you know, um, asking uh, townspeople. I'm um, more interested in different groups, and I know we put that out there, but I'm not sure that maybe all groups understand the process, but I would be perfectly satisfied if the council chair uh, appointed somebody, maybe a townsperson, a citizen, a um, senior citizen group person or, or something. I mean, if you, if you appoint a senior citizen group person, then maybe somebody says, well, now the senior citizens have their foot in the door. But I guess what I'm saying is the school board has their foot in the door. So uh, I'm just, I'm throwing that out. Maybe the council's interested, maybe they're not. Um, I just, um, it bothers me a tiny bit, so. Okay. Yes, Pat. I think it does make sense to, to look at at least having um, someone else on the committee. I think just in the sense that there, if there is the perception that this, um, the school's proposal, wherever it came from the hub, um, does trickle up to be the, the, the best, the, um, the best you know, organization to take it over. It may or may not be. But I think it, would be, um, it wouldn't be very difficult. And I think it's a good point to have perhaps you, Molly, the chair, appoint another person just so that we have um, there's thorough, uh, thorough vetting of what should be um, the, you know, the future use of that building. Thank you. Caitlin. Um, I was just to clarify, this did start out as a, a committee to review just that proposal. And then the council, as it often does, massaged it and moved it into reviewing all proposals and expanding it to you know different options and then we decided to include the school board members not because of their proposal per se but because of their proximity to the building and that their input would be needed as to whatever we were going to decide to put in to that building so that we had the school perspective from that angle my concern with adding more members which you want to add more members great fine um, is the timing um, do we add a senior citizen committee member and then where do we stop? Do we add a historical society member? Do we add I don't, you know, a Cape Farm Alliance member, a, a business alliance member? Like where do you stop with adding members and which committees get picked as to who to add? And then to the you selecting somebody at random or just one citizen at large, how does that person get selected? Is it just somebody that you happen to know as the chair or do we have people apply like they would for the appointments committee? I'm just <coughs> not sure how you know you would do that with full transparency as we strive to do. I mean we did that with the um, the recycling, the long range planning for the, the recycling center. People were just selected just because they knew people and they thought they'd be good on the committee. There was no appointments process. I was kind of upset about how that committee was selected because I don't think that's how our town should be putting together town committees by just plucking, picking people who know the right people. And so I just don't know how we move forward from here. Thank you. Other? Yes, Jessica. You could um, consider maybe one school board member, one town councilor, one citizen at large, and maybe one senior citizen, um, one Cape Preservation, Historical Preservation Society member, given the responses that were on the survey, I mean, to my recollection, I mean, I, once again, my recollection, I have to look at it again, those were the, the most frequent uh, parties of interest that I recall. But that would balance it out more. And with only one counselor and only one school board member, you, you know, you have three more, if you wanted to keep it a committee of five, you would have three more positions on it. And it certainly would have the perception, a better perception of balance. I mean, we've, we've, we've all received a couple of emails recently 
expressing this concern. I actually uh, was in the IGA a month ago, not quite, no, about three weeks ago, and someone whom I do not know and have, have no idea who this lady is, middle-aged lady, came up and expressed the same thing. Just sort of, you're on the town council, what's going on with that committee and why aren't there more people on it? Because I responded to that survey and I don't know what her affiliation is. I don't, you know, one of those quick comments. And it was just one comment, but given, you know, what we've seen recently, it might be, it might be a way to balance the members of the committee. I'm Thank certainly you. interested in figuring that out. <laughs> Any other comments on that? Yes, sir. I mean, I'm fine with everything everyone said. I would just say, if we give the committee a clear charge, I, I trust whoever's on it to be a grown-up. I mean, just because they're two school board members doesn't mean they can't think objectively and understand that they're supposed to be vetting all proposals, ditto with the council. Although I'm not opposed to having five different people, I think that's a great idea. I think 80% of success is in the directive we give them. I mean, we've got to figure out what the committee's doing. Is it trying to figure out best use across all the possibilities in town? I think that's what it should be. I mean, we started out saying, figure out if the school board proposal is good, but if people want to back it out and say what's the best use of it, give that as the charge. I, I think people will act with responsible adultness. <laughs> you know, I mean. Deb, do we have a motion on the table? You, you do. Remind me of who you do. Yes, you do. Uh, <clears throat> Caitlin made the motion, Sarah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the motion that we have right now is item number 44 as written, correct? Yes. And do we have a request for an amendment, a proposal or a motion for an amendment on this? <clears throat> and if so, is there someone who would like to make that amendment? And if so, what is it? I've heard a couple of options along the way about what the makeup of the committee might be. Would anyone like to make a motion to amend it? I, I would defer to Councillor Sullivan. I liked her idea, but I don't remember exactly what it was. I think your recommendation was one school board member, one council member, and bringing in a number of other potential participants from other organizations in the community. Right. I was just thinking, and to Councillor Lennon's comments, um, yeah, I've no doubt that people would, you know, follow the charge. It's just, it does have the appearance of being weighted currently, the way it's set up. So I would propose an amendment that this committee consists of five members, one town councillor, one member of the school board, uh, one member of the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission, one member of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society, and one citizen at large. Try that. Thank you. <clears throat> Does an amendment require a second? Mm. Yes. Is there a second? Thank you. <clears throat> Discussion about that. Caitlin, go. Or, oh, Jamie, go ahead. Happy. Jamie, I was just going to ask how the member at large gets selected. You had the amendment. Did you want to make a? a well, I, to your amendment. <laughs> uh, the amendment, well, the amendment at large could be selected by the appointments committee. Uh, you know, I don't. Jamie. Um, regarding that last point, I, I don't have any issue with the chair um, uh, using discretion to an appoint a member at large. I think that um, chair is more than capable of uh, using fair judgment to do that, and in the interest of expediency to get this moving. Um, as somebody who's on the appointments committee, I, I'd actually encourage that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I do, I, I agree with the effort to create better balance uh, among all the potential interested parties. Um, and if we all agree here tonight on a finite list, as Councillor Sullivan has made with her amendment here, I think that's great. I, I also do somewhat share Caitlin's perspective, though, of, well, why stop at just these groups? I, I mean, I, I think there is potential to still have some people then disenfranchised if that's the, if, if we're saying, well, we'll take one from here, one from here, one from here, but then there are two or three that remain sitting on the outside. 
Um, I suppose you can argue that you know they've been they've been addressed by the, the at large member, um, but it still seems to be somewhat arbitrary then of of who gets to be at the table and who doesn't. Right. Yes, Jessica. I'm happy to <laughs> amend my amendment to, <laughs> to uh, uh, support the council chair selecting an at heart at large member. I just hadn't thought of that, but I have full confidence in that. Um, and to Council Garvin's comments, I, I completely sympathize. Um, yet, the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission has, in their report, you know, repeatedly requested space in town. And we have discussed community services as being an appropriate space. Absolutely, and I, I support that. Yet there is an organization that has made this request repeatedly in there, you know, and so there is an example of why I would recommend that someone from that or, you know, well, former ad hoc committee be invited to participate. And the reason I recommend the Historical Pres Preservation Society is that though they are in temporary quarters that apparently are satisfactory, they are, have expressed interest. Uh, repeated interest in the past in that in that space. So those those two jump jump out because they they are on record, um, and I and I think probably a citizen at large, and as well as the integrity of the rest of the committee members would entertain any other request that would come forward. So. Thank you, Caitlin. We're going to be snowed in. Um, I just like to point out the gentleman who spoke first thing this evening about the firing range committee talked about how we put that committee together and we took people from this side and that side and put them on the committee and now they've created a conflict of interest potentially that we may need to look into but is that kind of not what we're doing right now we've got um, the senior student advisory committee has an interest in it the historical society has an interest in it such and such group could have an interest in it and aren't we just putting them all on this committee to so that they, you know, they can push forward potentially their interest. When, if we look at, we've got the council and we've got the school board, those are two the most important, I would feel, two board committee things in our town, the school board and the town council. They are the crux of our town. So it just to me makes sense that you would have the, the school board's interest because of the proximity of the, of, to the school and, you know, they, they are involved in the community as well as the town council would have the, the two members. And then maybe we do get a citizen at large to balance it. A citizen who has no interest in any of these other committees who is totally unbiased in every way as the fifth person, because I think an odd number is always important. And we're going into this with four, so that's not the best idea. So that's just another idea I would like to voice. Thank you. Jamie? Uh, yeah, I, I would suggest actually even, and it won't make me any friends on the school board, but that um, a three-person subcommittee of the council is probably even better suited than um, anything that is sort of addressing all, all these different individual interest groups. Thank you. Anyone else over here? Yes. Uh, actually, I'd support either um, Councillor Sullivan or Councillor um, um, I was going to say Wagner. Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> the other one. The other one. <laughs> the other one. Um, proposal. Um, and I'm, I'm absolutely happy for the um, chair to be um, appointing those. I just, as a side note, I'll uh, say that last year um, the council unanimously voted that I could appoint the um, members of the um, <clears throat> transfer station committee. and. Uh, of all the things I did last year, I sort of am proud of that one because <laughs> I think we got some great people. So anyway, we're, we're off tr topic, but I will support either one, but I'm happy to have the councillor, uh, the, the chair, uh, appoint these folks. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Before we vote, I would like to say when we're about to vote on the amendment on the table from Councillor Sullivan with her further amendment, I think, which said that <laughs> Hey, would you like to read it back to us so I yes. get it straight? Currently, the <clears throat> amendment is the committee would be made up of five members. One member from the town council, one from the school board, one from historical preservation, one from senior citizen, one citizen at large who would be appointed by the town council chair. That's okay. fine. 
So before we vote on that, I would like to say, I'm, while I appreciate your amendment and your amended amendment, <laughs> um, I am going to vote against that because I would like to see us move forward with this item number 44 as written with one change, which is to um, add a fifth committee member who would be appointed by the chair and that would be a, a person at large from the community. I'd like to keep the emphasis on the two council members that we have already talked about participating on that committee and we have already had the discussion with the school board and they've selected their two potential committee members. So in the interest of expediency, I'll be voting against the amendment because I, do, I would like to come back and vote on what's on the table and, <clears throat> excuse me, amend that to incorporate an, a chair appointed at large committee member. Having said that, are we ready to vote on the amendment that's on the table? Yes. All in favor? Did you want to say something or are you voting? You're voting? Uh, I would like to comment. Yes, please. I like Councillor Garvin's recommendation, hadn't thought of that, and I'd like to withdraw my amendment and my amendment to my amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a sense of humor here about <laughs> amendments. That was a great idea. And procedure. So okay. now we're back to having a conversation about the original one, or has no, anyone made a motion? We need another amendment. We, we need a new amendment. We, we have motion. an original motion on the table then, correct? If you have withdrawn your amendment. I've withdrawn mine. I believe your original second. amendment's on the table. We had a second on the amendment? No, oh, we did. Yes? Who oh, was the Who's second? second? So do we need the second to withdraw her second? Is that a vote? Or just vote it down. Or vote, vote it down? It down. I, I withdraw it. <laughs> okay, we can vote it. We can vote it down, which would remove it. Right. Okay. We, we've all withdrawn it. We both withdrawn it. Isn't that point of Do you want us to vote on it? Would it be easier? Uh, I think it's, cl it's cleaner if we vote on it. So all in favor of the motion and the amendment as it was presented by Councillor Sullivan and seconded by Sarah. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. Got the big check mark next to that. Okay, so now we have the original motion back on the table. Yes? Yes. And Caitlin? I'd like to make an amendment <laughs> to my original motion. Thank you. To include a Member of the community at large appointed by the council chair. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with you that we should keep this as it stands. We, we're so far down the road. We've already talked to the school board members. Um, I just want to reiterate, I think they can be objective, uh, um, just passionate and fair. And for what it's worth, that makes up a committee of four elected people mm -hmm. by the town. So it's a little different than appointments. It's a little different than an ad hoc committee or board. You have four elected people. I guess the assumption is that they're reasonable. And <laughs> so I, I, I like your, I like, I like two council members, two school board members, and a citizen at large who's just randomly interested for no self-interested reason. I think they're, 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 I think they're capable of weighing it objectively. Okay. Other comments? No? All in favor of that original motion as amended by Caitlin? All in favor? Yes? Any opposed? Five, two? Okay, that motion passes. Thank you. I think we have made it through everything tonight except citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Yes, please come right back up. And please tell us your name and address again. Harry uh, from Pine Ridge Road. Uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity to address the council as a whole. Um, I'm the aquaculturist in Kettle Cove, and should any issues come across your desk, I just wanted to make myself available. Um, and I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions or anything. If anybody comes up to me, I'm happy to hang out and talk it over. Anyway, that's about it.
Thank you. I will say we are about to go into executive session, so my guess is you may be waiting around for a while if they're waiting for us to come out of that next item. Thank you. Okay. Item number 45-2016, the annual evaluation of the town manager. And we have a draft motion that I would appreciate someone reading for us. <laughs> yes, Jessica, thank you. <laughs> I move that we uh, go into executive session in conform uh, regarding annual evaluation of the town manager in conformance with one MRSA's, I think it's subsection 405-6A, uh, that we hereby enter into executive session to continue the out, uh, annual evaluation process for the town manager. Thank you. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you. All in favor? Yes. Wonderful. All right. We will move into executive session.